Okay, Sukuket, thank you for uh, spending this time with us today and joining us here at the IM4 Media Lab. The Indigenous Matriarch for Media Lab was brought together by Creative Director Loretta Todd alongside the Media Matriarchs, C. Swice, Amethyst First Rider, Tracy Kim Banu, and myself, Doreen Manuel. IM4 Media Lab is uh, a partnership with Emily Carr University. IM4 offers workshops for Indigenous artists, storytellers, producers, media creators, and community members to learn about XR, gain technical training, and develop skills to create their own VR, AR, and 360 video productions. Our goal is to support Indigenous creators to help build an Indigenous presence in the VR space. Indigenous, um, uh, we'd like to encourage you to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional territory that you enjoy where you currently live while we offer our I am for land acknowledgement. Hot squile, euch tenoya, Sanakula, qui ansna, tenachinfa aslahan, ochameo, e wanaox titameo, plus kahotmish ost almo, e taslewit ath mastimo, e homathquiam mastimo, an wanaox titameo. Hot squile, shquen qui ansna, tenachan plus lewat ochameo. My name is Sanakula and my family comes from the Squamish village state called Eslahan. Yay, my name is Ocean and I come from the people of Slowtooth, the people of the inlet, and I carry the ancestral name Tsimtalat. Hey everybody, what's up? It's me, Miss Christy Lee, and I come from this place called Malay, where we are sitting today at the mouth of the river. This is the home of my ancestors, the home of my children, and the home of our future generation. These are the shared village sites and lands and waters of, I was saying in translation, of the Squamish people, the Tsleil-Waututh people, and the Musqueam people. I think I am four and fifth in this collaboration of these storytellers. Um, I thank them for reaching out and acknowledging the, the people of Slotuth, the people of Musqueam, and the people of Squamish um, to move forward with their work in a good way to acknowledge these people of, of the land that they're working on and collaborating in that way and um, acknowledging the storytellers of this land to move forward with their storytelling work. And so I'd like to say Chin Kwamintomi and Tamata Kwetsi Kwian Snechem. I just wanted to give a great big Haichka, Haitsepka, Haitsepka to all the matriarchs, all the filmmakers, the cinematographers, the editors, the sound people, um, everybody who's holding it down at the IM4 Labs. Much love to all the work that you do, much success and blessings for this virtual celebration that you're holding. Haitsepka, Haitsepka Nasiem Nasiaya. Respect. We are doctors, we are lawyers, we are teachers, we are scientists, we are engineers, we are medicine men, we are medicine women, we are traditional language speakers, and we are still here. We are still here.
What an upbeat way to start our workshop together. I'd like to uh, also start by acknowledging our sponsors who have made this sharing opportunity possible. Thank you for our, your collaboration, Emily Carr School of Art and Design, and all the great people at Emily Carr, like Leanne Rooney and Dr. Stephen Lamb, and of course, the president, Dr. Jillian Sedell. And of course, uh, our funders, Western Diversification, Congress of Aboriginal People, event sponsors, Creative BC, and VIF Immersive, Immersed, sorry. We also like to thank organizations like Discovery Foundation, Microsoft, and the CMF and CDM. I'm Doreen Manuel. My traditional name is uh, Ken Kaken, and I'm Sukwapmik and Tanaha. I'm the sixth child of uh, George and Marceline Manuel. I'm a graduate of the Aboriginal Film and Television Program at Kapolei University, and I have a Master's in Fine Arts in Film Production from UBC. I've directed for television as a Canadian correspondent for the Native Heartbeat and Northwest Indian News, and in various other roles in the film and television industry. You can check me out on IMDb or my website, runningwolf.ca, or on Facebook under Running Wolf. I, um, my, I'm also a bead artist and my art can be found under artist on the homepage of my website. I contributed 12 years of my life as a program coordinator dedicated to the development of the Indigenous Independent Digital Filmmaking Program at Capilano University. I was awarded the Woman in Film and Television Leadership and Education Award and I was their 2019 Woman of the Year. I own Running Wolf Productions. I'm on the board of directors of Knowledge Network and Moving Images Distribution. I serve as a member on the Telefilm Indigenous Working Group and the MPA Equity and Inclusion Committee. And as an advisor to the Tell a Story Hive Indigenous Envelope, and I'm also an I am for Matriarch Advisor. And I am currently the director of the BOSA Center for Film and Animation at Capilano University. I am very honored and privileged to introduce our most amazing guests. Amelia Winger Bearskin is an artist technologist who helps communities leverage emerging technologies to affect positive change in the world. She founded IDEA New Rochelle, which partnered with the NR Mayor's Office to develop citizen-focused VRAR tools and was awarded the 2018 Bloomberg Mayor's, a channel, a Mayor's Challenge, which is a $1 million grant to prototype their AR Citizen Toolkit. Amelia is Iroquois of the Seneca Cayuga Nation of Oklahoma. She is of the Deer Clan. Nancy Lee is a Taiwanese-born interdisciplinary media artist, curator, filmmaker, and cultural producer. Nancy is the co-producer and co-founder of Current, Feminist Electronic Art Symposium, an intersectional and multidisciplinary initiative featuring artistic and educational programming for and by women, non-binary artists, and artists of color. She co-created Telepresence, a VR eight-channel surround sound live performance with Western Front and Tidal and Tidal Traces, a VR 360 dance film with the National Film Board of Canada. Currently, Nancy is collaborating with Kieran Bumber uh, on a speculative sci-fi exhibition exploring 3D scanning, printing, XR, and live performances scheduled for 2021 at the Richmond Art Gallery. Wow, you women are incredibly accomplished. And we are so very thrilled to be hosting you today and to learn from you today. And I, I'd like to start off by asking you if we could get an update on the work that you are currently working on. Thank you so much, Doreen. It's such an honor to be back with I Am Four from last week. I had so much fun um, speaking with Kite and everyone and doing a great workshop this weekend with your amazing um, students who were just so accomplished and had, had just been leaders of their communities in so many different directions. And uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for having me and having um, Nancy together. 
um, a little bit of update is, is right now I am um, a developer evangelist at Contentful, which is a headless CMS uh, tech startup. I'm, I moved to Oakland, California uh, to take that role in San Francisco. Um, I'm originally from New York and my tribe is originally, our ancestral homeland is in um, upstate New York as well as uh, north into Canada. Um, and we also have been rehomed in Oklahoma and that's where our reservation is. Um, but this year I've also been awarded a Mozilla Fellowship uh, where I'm embedded with the MIT co-creation studio with Kat Zizek. Mm -hmm. And I'm working on a project called wampum.code. So I think we'll, we'll be showing a clip of that in a little bit, but it's a project around ethics and software development, as well as a podcast that features indigenous creatives who are using technology in unique and creative ways to make positive impact on their communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, I am currently um, working on learning uh, this new platform, um, A-Frame. It's a web VR platform and I'm teaching a workshop for it um, on Friday. So I've actually been spending the last month uh, learning this uh, uh, platform just because I am for lab uh, contacted me and asked me to teach a workshop um, but I haven't really taught any workshops um, in this online format and as you know with COVID um, VR viewing sharing headsets and things like that is there's a lot of barriers to that now so I was just thinking of new ways uh, where we can use more accessible technology like our computers or our mobile phones um, for folks to be able to engage with this emerging technology. So I've just been spending the last month learning um, the thing I'm going to teach uh, this Friday. Um, so that's super exciting. And that's also part of my practice because um, as Doreen has said that I'm working on this exhibition next year at the Richmond Art Gallery and working with, uh, with my main collaborator, Kira Bum Kieran Bumber, who's a media artist, composer, and educator. Um, and we're uh, trying to envision this uh, future world where um, we, her and I were, she's South Asian, um, I'm Taiwanese, uh, where we're going to get married um, in the future. So we're exploring like wedding and ceremonies and rituals and the concept of that and what that would look like a thousand years uh, from now in a post-apocalyptic context. Um, and then also uh, with the technology that we had um, in our proposal now, because of COVID, we are spending time trying to re-adapt the kind of work that we're gonna do because you know it might, we might, might not be able to have VR headsets for folks to share. So because of this, I've been dabbling a lot more into uh, AR and web ARs to, again, uh, with technology that's more accessible uh, to people from the comfort of their own home. That's exciting. I'm curious about uh, your training. Like, how did you get where you are, each of you? Because this is this is a really new field, right? This is like so few people are doing this work right now, and you are forging the trails for so many other people to follow in your footsteps. And I'm wondering what paths you took to get to where you are today. Um, I, I guess I had no training. <laughs> um, that's the thing, which is encouraging. That's encouraging. For everybody. <laughs> I didn't go to art school. Um, I didn't, I like didn't, I didn't know I wanted to be an artist until my mid twenties. I thought I was going to go to med school actually my entire life. Um, so it totally changed things up. Um, but I think it's just through community building and through uh, building relationships. I have a lot of friends that are artists um, and I got really into documentary filmmaking because I wanted, I was working on some projects um, in Vancouver telling Chinese Canadian histories just because that has been completely erased from our, you know, social studies and humanities um, uh, teachings and our education system. So um, I was trying to do documentary to document the experience of like intergenerational households. And through that process, I got really into filmmaking. And then because I was working with that technology and I had a bunch of musician friends to start doing music videos, started VJing. Um, and then uh, through that, I started meeting other artists and collaborating with other artists. Um, and that's mo most of my learning comes through collaboration from other artists. I got into like media art, interactive art, um, like in 
2014, 2015, doing like interactive installations. And then through like that interactivity and like film, I got really into this VR realm when the VR boom started happening. Cause I was like, that's like a perfect merge between the two mediums, film and like interactive art um, in this like immersive environment. So it's like, I could take what I know in film and cinematography um, and also take what I know with all the problem solving that is required uh, with media art and emerging technology and kind of like fuse that into one. Yeah. How about you, Amelia? Well, I, you know, I was actually raised by an amazing Haudenosaunee Iroquois mother who um, was a storyteller. And so she gathered the stories from our community and shared them with the wider world, but also gathered stories from other nations and other indigenous groups and became an educator um, through, you know, the many different like functions that a storyteller does within our indigenous community, right? Where you're kind of a politician, you're kind of a, a historian, you're a performer, you're an artist. It's, um, it's really exciting. And that was the first, um, you know, my introduction to how you, to be in the world was to kind of fuse those things together um, to build community and to build uh, democracy and to build safety and trust. And she homeschooled me. My, I never went to um, public school. Um, and when I was very young, I became an opera singer. I went to the Eastman Conservatory oh. of Music and I, I studied uh -huh. opera. Uh -huh. So That's my wonderful. first introduction to any kind of, uh, like formalized school was, uh, Eastman Conservatory of Music for Vocal Performance. And it was very old fashioned. It was kind of like they hadn't changed since what they imagined it was like in the 1700s, like Mozart, uh, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and, um, well, and uh, I loved it. I, I loved this, the super formality, the like, you know, the way my mom raised me was very expressive and open and at music conservatory was actually very prescriptive and very constrained. And I, I, I liked that. I liked having something to have a very specific tool set to rail, to like think about and explore. And I, then I think I just got hooked on school because I have so many degrees. I just really loved it. I never went to school until I was older and then I loved it. I went to, um, to uh, George Mason where I studied uh, digital art and um, sort of a combination of programming and, and computer programming and art and projections and animation and robotics and electronics and then I went to um, UT Austin where I studied transmedia, which was very similar. It was like a hybrid between sort of advanced um, uh, like GPU processing for animations and art and fine art program. And then I went to NYU's ITP program, which is they call it the Center for Recently Possible. So it's mm. it's sort of like if you took the MIT Media Lab and gave people even less constraints and <laughs> it's just kind of like this wild, um, uh, a lot of people who have gone to Tisch School of the Arts say, when you open the door on the fourth floor, you'll see drones, you'll see 3D printers, probably somebody dancing, someone singing, and you never really know what to expect. So that was an incredibly generative experience. So I don't know, I, I kind of, I went all in on the training. I love cohorts. You know, I love being part of um, communities. And so each of the cohorts I was in school are still deeply part of my community. I just did the ITP camp this summer and learned a lot more about new, you know, new things that people are coding. And I did the New Inc. cohort. I'm now a Mozilla cohort. I just love cohorts. <laughs> mm, that's amazing. Yeah. And I've, I've been in the Sundance New Frontier Story Lab and um, a couple of their like native and VR labs. Um, if you're someone who likes community, I, I highly recommend doing some of these fellowships or residencies. Um, and they're all kind of popping up to support people who are exploring these new spaces. And, and many of them do not preclude anyone that is just ex like has experience in one area and would like to see if it if this new, um, if emerging technologies could be interesting to them. And so I like that. I like that a lot of these spaces are saying, it doesn't matter, like, especially like the New Frontier Story Lab or the Sundance Institute Native Lab, it doesn't really matter if you've ever made something in this field before, but if you have an, an, an interesting idea, if you're the right person to tell that story, maybe these tools can help. Then I like that. I love what you said about the transfer of knowledge between your matriarch to you and your evolving identity as a matriarch. I don't know if it's to 
that I have a hard time grasping technology, period. I, that might be actually it. Or if I'm an older woman, not quite sure. But when I took the some of the VR workshops that I took, I brought my daughter with me. She's um, she's 30 and she's, you know, like she grew up in that age of technology. So her and my son are just, they followed me into the industry. So yeah. like my son set up my mic system here like moments before I came online. And um, uh, Claudia came with me and thank God, because my brain was hurting. So much information was being, you know, dropped into my brain and I was taking notes and I was trying to stay caught up, but she was learning like fluid. She was so fluid with it and she was on the computer and she was, uh, you know, explaining things to me a little bit more carefully so that it would stick better. And uh, I just love that uh, transfer of knowledge uh, among, you know, the older and the younger, but also, you know, between the women. You know, yeah. like this art that you're wearing on your arm and the art that I'm wearing on my arm, this is an indigenous, in our culture, it's an indigenous woman thing. It's the woman yeah. who tattoos yeah. and, it, and it's the woman who passes it on. And the stories are, are all built in here between that passing of knowledge and we're carrying knowledge right on our bodies and art. Um, so I wondered, you know, being both of you evolving matriarchs, how, you know, you started to talk about about it to some degree, Amelia. How does that shape the art that you tell, the stories that you weave into your art? Yeah, I think it's it's. I, I think of myself so much as a part of the community and the responsibility I have to the community, and that storytelling is a function of um, maintaining peace and prosperity within the community. And so my art making practice, I think, becomes an extension of that. And oftentimes people ask me like, oh, that's, you know, that's interesting that you're an artist and you also worked, you know, with cities and built um, centers that people could, of centers of learning as well as making your own art. And then, but to me, that seems what the function of art is, right, is to create community, to create peace and prosperity to make sure that it can be a tool for um, for teaching and and making sure that our the insights that we learn and that we have learned from the generations before us are passed on um, and that we can interrogate things that are that we need to leave behind um, and I think that's really important so you know, I, I don't know. That's why I think why a lot of my work is very integrated into community, whether it's and it's teaching others or create or fostering a community for others, or if it's if I'm personally driving a project as an artist, I still see myself as as a deep product of my community and, and a and a collective thinker. Um, it's really important to me. All, all of the all the cohorts that I, I'm in or, or AI collectives or indigenous women collectives. Um, and I think as um, you know as a Haudenosaunee woman, as Seneca Cayuga nation, um, that is a, a key part of our, of our teachings and principles of our culture is that, um, that, that women will, will take that role. And I, I have a very beautiful son that he also is, is looks and uses technology in lots of interesting and beautiful ways himself, but he, he totally understands technology in different ways than I do, even though maybe, maybe I know the history of whatever thing he's using and maybe I could decode this language faster in some respects, but then he understands the way that it is formed and forms for his community in, in totally radical, amazing ways. And I taught him what I know, but he teaches me He's always taught me ever since he's been born, right? They, his, his new eyes in the world um, become an extension of our ancestors, and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that you talk about the kind of two-way um, exchange um, when we do teachings and mentorship. You know, I work on a lot of projects uh, like you, Amelia. My work is really embedded within the community. You know, I am a media artist. I'm a community organizer, like culture producer. I work with the city of Vancouver to develop pilot grant programs. I do consulting to make programs more accessible. Um, just because, you know, what how I think about it is like, it's not enough to just make work because oftentimes, you know, as like a person of color, a woman um, or queer person, there isn't really a space for you within our, you know, society. So it's, you not only have to make work, 
you have to be carving out space for your work to exist and at the same time. Um, so that's why the community work is um, extremely um, important to to do and like with the project uh, current um, current symposium, the feminist electronic art symposium that um, I'm co-producing. Um, like we, the first two years we were just doing like showcases um, with women and non-binary um, artists, and then for our third um, year we turned the program into a mentorship program instead. So instead of taking all of the funding that we got to do like an outward showcase, um, we wanted to invest in our local community. So we took all the funding and then had a small uh, mentorship cohort. I love creating cohorts too, um, and and then we brought in local um, culture producers to do like a three-day mentorship program with us, learning you know things like grant writing how to like uh how to create like sponsorship decks how to do budgeting how to write letters um and teaching them these skill sets that oftentimes don't get taught uh even with our even in um in educational institutions we don't really teach you like you know strategic ways of planning your projects and like how to navigate between stakeholders and things like that so um i, I feel like it's really important to continue doing that and you know like a two-way street I learned so much uh, from the people within my community you know I always like I never went to school for art but I always think about my community as the teachers for me like I went to the I, I got educated throughout my community and by being an interdisciplinary artist I have the privilege to be able to work with choreographers like composers um, a visual artist and I learned so much from different fields and I feel like that's where it's just so enriching to be able to learn um, directly um, from a person and uh, learn in a way where you can also create uh, something together individually. This might be a good time to uh, introduce us to the video clip that you have um, because I find it really interesting how you mix the movement, the body movement into the piece and the sound, the the whole the whole way that you you put things the whole artwork together so do you mind uh, introducing your work and showing it to us yeah um sure i'll just oh. <laughs> um so this is the first this is my first art project like ever um and with this project um it's an interactive swing installation and uh, as an interactive swing installation this is like my first immersive piece um that i've ever worked on and made and um I met my longtime collaborator now, Kieran Bumber, through this project. And essentially, we met at a party where I'd installed a bunch of swings. It was kind of like an underground rave party, and I thought it was a good idea to install a bunch of swings. Um, and then she came to the party. I had projections that were not interactive. Um, and she was she hit me up afterwards um, and was like, hey, like I can actually make your swings interactive. I'm a composer. I work in music technology. I know how to work with sensors. Like, let's make these interactive swings. So like fast forward a year later, we were able to showcase our work at the Vancouver Jazz Festival. And this is at New Forms Festival. Um, we were able to build a swing together. And I, before that, I have never done any like formal art exhibition or presentation before. Um, but this is this would be like my first take um, into a immersive technology kind of world, um, which is more externalized. And then Tidal Traces um, is the um, VR 360 dance film. Um, that I worked on with choreographer Emelina Fredrickson. And um, with this project, it was a long process um, because we, you know, I had no idea how to work on this technology. So it was just like, it was took two years of trial and error. Um, and we pitched this to the NFB and they were really into the project. So they supported our project. And once they supported our project, it was still like another year of trial and error and like hardcore learning how to deal with technology. Um, but yeah, there's, I can talk, I'll, I'll, I'll loop back into that project and talk a little bit more about this. Um, so the next um, video clip that is showing, this is a project me and Kieran Bumber did again. And this, is hap this happened uh, in fall 2018. And we wanted to take VR headsets uh, to develop like a live performance kind of environment using VR headsets and uh, with live uh, trumpet performer JP Carter. And Kieran also did the sound that was spatialized um, with eight speakers and two subs uh, within a performance context. And we were really interested in researching uh, what it's like to create a collective 
viewing experience for virtual reality because a lot of times VR experiences is very individualized, um, slightly awkward sometimes when you you know when you go to uh, film festivals you just have a bunch of people kind of checked out or like lined up um, or just seating and sit uh, seating in their own chairs. So we just wanted to kind of do research and figure out a project how to create an environment and the value of a collective uh, viewing experience through this and a, a, bu a, bu a bunch of the kind of you know the things that we learned from this project uh, was that a big part of uh, what makes a collective viewing experience unique is the time you get to spend before the show and the time you get to spend after show much like going to a cinema together there's a social element um, of you know going to a show together where you can talk about the project and then you go and experience something together and then you can talk about and reflect on the project afterwards um it's a form it's almost like a way of building relationships and deepening relationships uh with people around you uh that you share collective experiences with oh, i saw a number of um funders on that project was it difficult <laughs> to get funding <laughs> yeah i think for immersive technology stuff it's it's always like that's always a big part, you know, because it's it's really it, it is expensive um, and it's hard to make happen. Um, but there are definitely, you know, like for that last project, Telepresence, it took us two years and lots of rejection. You know, every single project I've done actually came like, you know, you see the project now, you see the logos for the funders. But every project that I've ever done comes with tons of failures and rejection from funding as well, too. Mm. Amelia, you have a clip to show us too, don't you? Uh, yes, thank you. I think Ken will go ahead and play it. Right now, I'm working on a project called Wampum.Codes. It's a project with Mozilla uh, Foundation, a fellowship with embedded at MIT's uh, co-creation studio with Kat Sizak. And um, I've been working on the history of Wampum and, and how that connects to software development and ethics and ethical dependencies in software development. And I'd like to read you a little statement that I wrote about that. If history was written by the victors, then the future will be written by the vectors. Artificial intelligence will radically change our world, our lives, our planet, and it remains to be seen if it will be a positive or a negative. If it's said that those who fail to study history are doomed to repeat it, I would add that those who ignore data have underfitted models. When Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were looking for a new model to serve as a basis for the United States government, they were very impressed by the Iroquois Confederacy, we call ourselves the Haudenosaunee, people of the Longhouse, were made up of the Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, Onondaga, Mohawk, and Tuscarora. Thomas Jefferson spent over a year with us in upstate New York in one of our largest cities. When Jefferson and Franklin and the other founding fathers drafted the U.S. Constitution, they cherry-picked the best parts that were most beneficial to their own political purposes, the bits that seemed to align the best with their Enlightenment-era ideology, representation, voting, checks and balances, etc. But they left out the social and cultural networks that sustained these practices in the actual Iroquois Confederacy. Well, what did they leave out? In the Iroquois Constitution, women, Clan mothers from each tribe were the only ones who could vote for the representative who was always a man, a chief. Actually, the word for clan mother and chief is the same word. There was a balance of power. Only men could serve and only women could vote. Their economy was driven through complex agricultural arrangements. Everyone in the community participated in planting and harvesting. It was not an economy of slavery dependent plantation agriculture. This is an example of colonial mindset. I see it, I like it, I want it, I'll take it. I take it and I take what will benefit my own paradigm, but I'm unconcerned with the effect it will have being taken out of context and the effect it'll have on the people I take it from. This is like trying to run a program without checking its dependencies. What if it turns out that the Confederate democracy or lasting peace and prosperity is dependent upon a balance of power along gender lines? or upon a different economic model than the one practiced by European settlers in North America? Or what if it imagines a system of agriculture where the environment is protected and maintains sus sustainable practices? We all have colonial mindset just because our culture has colonial mindset. But here's the thing, we're not colonial subjects and we don't have to live under a colonial empire anymore. 
In data science, we talk about models suffering from either overfitting or underfitting. Overfitting is when a model exhibits a low degree of bias, but a high degree of variance. In other words, it accepts a lot of differences within the data, but it doesn't have very much predictive power. Underfitting is the inverse of this, high bias, low variance. This is what happens when you make a generalization without enough data, or when the data is not diverse enough to represent the real world. The big problem with colonial mindset is one of underfitting, extracting idea without the context that made that idea work in the first place. I'm here to say, don't colonize our future. Our plans for the future need to include more data from diverse cultures and societies, and not only those ideas that flatter what we already think. For instance, let's say you want to lay the groundwork for a society run on the blockchain. What does that look like? How does that work? What are the consequences? If we don't have significant data, we might just have to wing it. But we actually have thousands of years of data about decentralized economies. The use of wampum um, among the Iroquois functioned as a decentralized distributed ledger of contracts, and it helped us govern, govern our society for centuries. Wampum is an example of what I've termed antecedent technology, and there are many more cases like this. In South America, the Inca had a Turing-complete system of knot tying called Kipu, which predated modern computing by hundreds of years. When we want to use powerful new technologies such as AI or blockchain, and we want as much data as we can to help us imagine positive change in the world, we do not need to throw out thousands of years of data that can fuel the next giant leaps our communities will make with technology. I want people to know that indigenous people had technologies that have solved complex issues. I want us to use their data to help us dream our future, and I want us to believe that just because we have had 500 years of slavery, worker exploitation, poverty, and gender imbalance, we have had thousands of years of peace, prosperity, and equality right here in the country where I'm standing right now. That's magnificent. Both of your works are so... Uh so unique i'm wondering we're, we were experiencing that in a you know a two-dimensional like a flatter is that 3d though can we step into those worlds um for, for the piece that i i i i made that for you know for this talk um it's a piece that i showed at mia for the hearts of our people exhibition which was the largest indigenous uh, women's artist shows so far in the world. I don't, I don't know how that's possible, but it was at Mia in Minnesota. And so they took two um, beautiful flat screens of like 8K and pushed them next to each other to make it a little square to show that video. But I made it um, actually on all of those um, images I made on my cell phone. I got really, I used to bead all the time on the airplane. I know Doreen, you're a beater <laughs> too. You're a better beater than I am. <laughs> but I, I used to be just because I hate flying and I beat all the time. And then after 9-11, people started kind of being like, what are you, <laughs> you have all these porcupine quills and like crazy stuff. And people started taking my beating stuff when I would try to take it on the plane. So I thought I have to figure out a different like way to bead. And I'm like, oh man, I'm a technologist. I can figure this out, you know? So I started, you know, using like six different apps on my phone to kind of make the same patterns, um, that I used to beat in. And then I made this video um, that's sort of a moving moving tableau of those. Um, and, and then I showed that at, uh, at Mia, but I added this um, sort of talk to it for you here at IM4, because um, I thought it made a nice visual background rather than just staring at me talking. <laughs> so. That's magnificent. That, that's mind boggling that you made that on your phone. Yeah, wow. right? Yeah. Nancy, was the video clip, were the video clips that you showed us, are they 360? Um, Any of them? Yeah. So the first one, um, it's an interactive swing installation. And that one, you know, it's the analog 360 um, in real world. Uh, so you're in a room. Anybody can go and get on the swing and experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, that's exactly. Cool. We have projections all around, uh, projecting the wall. And uh, you sit on these swings. Um, and as you swing, there's two swings in that video for the show that we did at New Forms Festival in 2016, there's two swings. Um, and with the swings, they all have different parameters mapped to like the X, Y, Z axis. So depending how you move the swing seats, if you're moving it this way, if you're moving it this way or moving oh. it this way, it, ha it, uh, it controls different effects. Um, so you that are in control of your experience. Yes. Um, so essentially 
uh, what you know, we wanted to be able to show visually the kind of social interactions that happen, the relationship that happens between the people that are playing on the swings. So whatever that's outputted on the wall um, is inherently, it comes from um, the movement and the social playful dynamic that the people that are sitting on the swings have. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, and then for the second video, that was a 360 dance film. So that one that you saw that was in the water, um, that one was shot um, at Boundary Bay in Tawasson um, with three dancers. Um, and that one was a stereoscopic 360 dance film. So um, there's depth um, that was involved in that one. And for that film, it was pretty it was pretty challenging. It was probably the most challenging project I've ever done just logistically because we had to carry the um, the the Google Odyssey, like that 16 camera GoPro camera mm-hmm. setup, like into the middle of the ocean during low tide, during like the, the sun had to be right. And it was just all these like natural calculations that we had to make um, in order for us, like the stars had to align. We had only two days uh, with like 90 minute windows uh, within each day to shoot. Um, so the performers had to really you know, they, we had as directors and choreographers of that project, we really did not, could not really control much. Like we were just, we become facilitators at that point. And, and because with 360, you can't even be in the video. So we were in, we got our dancers out there and we just laid in the water, like hiding in the water while they danced. And we just had to trust them to uh, do the performance that uh, we had agreed upon uh, during rehearsals. So were you hiding under the camera? No, we were hiding, we we're in the water. So we would set up the camera and run to the horizon and lay in the water um, so uh, so we wouldn't be seen in the water and then the dancer was, uh, would perform. So the camera really didn't pick you up? You didn't have to- We, we, we actually did have to do like rotoscoping um, mm-hmm. at the end, uh, there, but it was just much less rotoscoping that we had to do. Uh, you could still see us. We became like specks kind of like in the distance, but um, it was just, it was hel- it was more helpful to be a- like unseen as possible uh, to make that uh, film happen. And because it was just, at that point, like our project was, I think it was like 16 terabytes. Like that's how big the project art. We had like so many hard drives. So it, we just wanted to make it as easy as possible because it took so long just to load everything. So it was almost like this technology was so new at that point. We did that film in 2017. Um, and like Adobe didn't really have a proper kind of 360 editing thing that was embedded in it. Um, so we just wanted to be able to make it as as easy as possible. But it was the process was so long that it almost felt like we were doing a film like ana- in, in a more analog way. But it's the opposite of that. Was your tripod actually in the water? Yes, the, the tripod water. was in the water with the camera on top. And then under with that um, camera specifically, there's this like 15 pound um, battery pack that also comes with this. We didn't even think about the battery pack, but then we we're like, oh shoot, there's a battery pack. So we got to hide the battery pack under the camera, um, under a Tupperware. And we were afraid the battery was going to overheat. So we had to put like, we, were, we had dry ice and stuff like that. But then as the water came in, the battery would float up in the Tupperware um, and it would knock the camera over so we had to put sandbags um, in and, and put sand into our Tupperware to like to sink it down so the uh, the really fancy camera would not fall into the water because we wouldn't be able to replace the camera. Well a learning experience huh? <laughs> So uh, is it different to rotoscope water out than it is to rotoscope a flat regular floor surface? Um, I did not have to do that work, thankfully. Um, bless Vince <laughs> McClurry from the National Film Board. Um, um, but I know the process was very tedious. Um, <laughs> and it was like, it was better to, it was, he definitely had to rotoscope. We had to actually end up rotoscoping a lot of land masses out because the camera picked up like these sandbars because the tide, we got, we calculated a certain time and the tide was going out. So as we, um, in at the Boundary Bay area, it's like an intertidal mudflat. So the kind of you see water for like kilometers. But as the tide would go out, um, we would have to take the camera and run and chase the tide out. So then we would still have enough water uh, for the dancers to perform in. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Amelia, those are all great, wonderful challenges. What sort of challenges can you share with our audience that you've had with the work that you've been working on that might help? 
them on their journey to, you know, illuminate thoughts and ideas around what sort of struggles we might all be facing? Um, <clears throat> I guess we're on the topic of 360 video, so I can so I can talk a little bit about the project I did with called Monsters with the artist Wendy Redstar. We both uh, we had we were um, part of the Google Jump um, program where they give you a the Google's Z Halo 2 research camera that's 360 and um, has some a little bit of depth uh, sensing as well. And, you know, very similar to Nancy, we had to sort of take this thing and we wanted to um, <clears throat> we wanted to film some some sacred sites in in Crow Nation and Crow Territory and River Crow Territory in Montana, which is Wendy's ancestral homeland and where her Red Star Ranch is. And you know, it was like snowing and muddy and all those fun things that you do whenever you, you get to take a whole setup with you. Um, and the shooting wasn't our, our difficulty. I think what, what we wanted, what we thought was the sort of story of these monsters that we wanted to tell the story of, um, the, the little people, um, but actually their name in Crow means the keepers of the land. And when we began to talk to a lot of the elders who, who were the keepers of these stories, um, you know, we thought they kind of have this this mischievous uh, reputation, and we thought that a lot of people maybe didn't want to talk to us about them because, like, bad luck or something like this, or bad, you know, just maybe maybe it wouldn't be appropriate, or maybe people wouldn't want to um, share something with us that um, that had kind of a mischievous nature to it. But actually, the more we learned about the from the elders who were the keepers of these stories. Um, we learned that their role in, in, you know, they have this mischievous sort of like people like to blame when things go wrong, you know, or, or something, all oh, the little people are, <laughs> what are they up to? But actually we started learning that all of those people who kept the stories of the keepers of the land, they themselves, when we asked them, oh, what do you do? Or what, tell, tell us a little bit about, oh, what, you know, when did, how many kids do you have? Oh, where did they go to school? It's just as we're doing small talk, we realized that each of those elders, had done tremendous work to maintain and preserve um, the land rights, the, the community rights, to, to just do tremendous good to keep the land and the community strong. And we realized that these were the keepers of the land. These are the people in the tradition of who we are looking for. We can choose to be the keepers of the land. And so we wanted to make this piece um, to allow other audiences to ask that same question of like, when you perceive a monster or like a myth or a story, <clears throat> maybe you choose to be the monster and you choose to defend something that needs to be defended and stand for something that needs to be stood for. Um, and so I think that that's an important part of creating any project really is of challenging your own assumptions and cha challenging even your own biases. Like we're indigenous women. We thought, oh no, we, we kind of know what we're doing. <laughs> we didn't know. You know, we, we still have to learn so much from elders and from the community and, and, and really do that work of talking to people and talking to someone who disagrees and talking to someone else who disagrees with that and, and doing that, that, um, that work that you never see in, in the final product, but it transforms it so tremendously because you're connecting again with, with, um, with your culture in, in a very um, humble way. Amazing. Um, what kind of difficulties have, we started to talk a little bit about funding struggle and Amelia, you got this amazingly huge grant to, have you completed that work or are you still working through it? And how do you even manage like a project <laughs> like that? That all came from one grant. Was there any other added funding? Did you struggle hard to get that funding? <laughs> yes, all yes to all of your questions. Well, you know, we had started off. Um, you know, we had were fundraising to create a space in the downtown area that could that could create a, a space of learning, something a positive impact for the community. And the reason that the city was interested in initially approaching me to work with them is they had wanted to make an arts district, an artist district, but the man who was in charge of the project, uh, Ralph DeBart, had made many artist project, 
artists uh, like colonies and communities like in in this in different areas around New York like Beacon or Soho or Chelsea um, or in the meatpacking district or in the theater district um, and so he'd done this for 65 years he worked with Jane Jacobs and all these kind of amazing city planners that were really thinking in different ways in New York City his wife was part of the New York, uh, Central Park uh, Preservation Committee that really brought back um, Central Park to the community in a lot of ways. So, you know, he he wanted to do something different. And he said, you know, I don't really think it makes any sense to kind of have a normal artist community it, it, right near some of these other artist communities I've already built. Um, but you're, you seem to be doing weird things <laughs> even with like technology and all this stuff. And he didn't know anything about these technologies, but he just knew that it was different. And so he said, you know, can you come up with some ideas for your community, whatever your community is, could you, would they be able to find a place here? And I said, well, my community is really like people of color who are working with emerging technologies. Is that like, great? So I, I built out the program and as we were fundraising, it took us, you know, two years to kind of fundraise, two and a half years to fundraise that, that grant. And we started with smaller grants and, and you have to build trust with the community, right? Like you, they have to see that you say you're gonna do a class and you deliver it. I mean, very similar to what you do. Of course, all the amazing work you do, Doreen, that I am for, right? You have to kind of build trust with the community. They have to see that you really mean it. But I also have to build trust with my community when the artist, when I tell artists like, oh, we have a motion capture facility and we have um, resources and you should be a fellow or you should contribute, you know, whatever time or you should be part of this community. It, there has to be something there for them that's worth it as well. Um, and so we raised funds to support projects for them. Um, you know, did surveys to find out what things they needed and then got the kind of equipment that they would need like motion capture and um, really powerful GPU uh, laptops that they could take out in the field or different types of cameras that they could play with. You know, we did a big survey of technology just to say, okay, you're already working in these spaces, but what are things that you, you wish you had and we have funding, we could purchase them and you guys could share them. Um, and then we actually had artists that lived above the train station in New Rochelle where we transformed it into a live work space because I, I believed that it was important to create a space where an artist could live full time, not just have a fellowship um, because rent is such a difficult thing in New York City and the surrounding areas that a lot of times people just want an opportunity to live rent free for a couple months in New York. And that in and of itself can be something that can help their career because they may have um, they may have opportunities in New York, but if they can't afford to stay there for a couple months, then that can be a really big um, inhibitor. So that's why I, I created that space where they would have you know, kind of like a longhouse. I thought it was like you know, got three people that stayed above the train station and they could kind of go into New York or they could go. Um, one person was also from MIT, so they could kind of go to Boston or to Cambridge and then they could come through. Um, so I kind of wanted to think of all of the needs that an artist might have um, like myself, um, sometimes it's equipment, sometimes it's money, sometimes it's a, a free place to stay for a while. So, um, and then after building that, that's when we were able to to really accomplish the project that we did that um, caught the attention of the Bloomberg um, Philanthropies and, and worked closely with the mayor's office to secure that grant. Um, but it took, um, the Bloomberg Philanthropies project had a really beautiful design sprint that they created so that you had about four or five months where they gave you $100,000 to kind of test your idea and to show how you would measure it before you um, received the million dollars, if you would. There were so, They said that, I, I think of all the 15 cities, um, five received the, the million dollars. Oh. But, you know, but you had to be invited to participate in as one of the 15 champion cities. Or actually, no, I think there was, 30 something that were asked to apply and then 15 that accepted to the test phase and then from there to um the five that got the million dollar grant yeah hmm. um i think we're almost getting ready to to move into the q a uh portion of the uh this workshop um maybe you could both just tell us being leaders in this field what have been your greatest challenges that you've had to overcome? Um, I guess for me, it's probably, it's cause you know, I never had any training. So it, a big part of it is kind of, is just 
I feel like the challenge is like overcoming your own self doubt too, because as a media artist, it's like every time it's like, I have this idea, this project, and then you're trying to think about what had the steps to get there and you have no idea like what are the steps that are required how much money it takes even uh to get to this idea and i think you know like you said uh, amelia said trust uh within your community is really important but also i feel like even just developing trust for yourself to be like oh okay i yes i got this i can do this or like um I can learn this because every project that I do, I don't know anything about anything. Like I don't, I, I feel like every project I've done, I had to learn all the softwares from scratch. Um, so, you know, oftentimes that is kind of a daunting uh, process. Um, and like every, even till today, like when I work on projects, even learning a frame for web VR, you know, is kind of a daunting process at first. Um, but I feel like it's just important to kind of overcome your own self doubt and just trust yourself that we are all, you know, empathetic beings and we are, we have the capability to learn anything we want. Mm -hmm. Amelia? I think, you know, technology can be a really great, um, it's like bait, you know, <laughs> when you're fishing. And, you know, we, we've always used, you know, different incredible technologies to solve the problems in our communities, you know, since before, um, you know, for since the dawn of time, right? Like that's what humans do. We've always used technologies, whether it's in harvesting or planting or, or learning about our dreams or passing on medicinal information. You know, technology is so important for our survival and for our creative brains and for our community to um, to help each other, right? To create collective systems. Um, and so I think it's a really it can be a really wonderful tool to get. Uh, people interested in what you're doing and sometimes I think that that's why I like it it's not even that it's VR or that it's artificial intelligence or that it's whatever new coding language I'm learning I like that you can use concepts of the new to bait people into talking about deep conversations about uh, what it means to be a human and I think it just kind of continues to be the same for me in that way. I think that's what we were able to do in New Rochelle, why we were able to get that large grant was we really just wanted to help the community and build trust in the community. And we were able to do that with this shiny new thing that, okay, well, let's try it with VR, <laughs> let's try it with AR, right? It was a, you know, they. I think, you know, the, the funders too want to fund um, creative things. They want to try new things and fun things, but this also has to kind of come back to just that core work. Like we're always going to invest in the community. We're always going to invest in ways that we can think of new ways that, um, that new technologies can maybe help and empower us. And people are willing to fund new experiments because we're hoping that it can bring new and beautiful results. So I'll, I'll keep using this space. Um, I like that people call it emerging media. I've been like emerging in media for 20 years or whatever. It's like, I don't know when it emerges or whatnot, but I, I like it. I like staying on the fringes of whatever is new in technology because it's a play place for the imagination. And I believe that it's like dream technology. It helps us remember from the future. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're starting to open up now uh, the question Q and A to our audience and our first question that's come in uh, is if a person wants to get into 360 video, what do you recommend they do? Like what kind of camera or software that they, they could, they should start with. And I'm assuming they mean something that's affordable. Yeah. I, I started with the Rico Theta, which is still a pretty good camera. Like even the newest one um, it's, you can definitely get the older ones under a hundred dollars, but it's very sturdy. Like I've dropped it a million times and done terrible things to it and it still keeps kicking. But I like a lot of those um, cameras and there's kind of different ones that come out every um, so often. So if you get one that like works with your phone that just clips on the top of it and then has a 360 camera with that's integrated with an app, there's, there's a bunch of different ones. So it doesn't matter if you have an iPhone or not, like whatever phone you have, you can kind of look up even like, this is an old phone. I could look up what works on the iPhone seven and then get that camera for 360. And then these apps auto stitch it. Um, and I like them because my, my professors in art school always said the best camera that you have is the one that's with you. And so I feel like if it's always, I always have my phone, I always can have this like tiny little device that I put on it, I can capture and play and begin to experiment. So I think it, that can be a fun way to get into it. Just have something that can fit in your pocket. 
so it clips right over the lens on your phone yeah and then it uses Does it have like a bug eye or something yep it has a bug eye exactly <laughs> it's a bug eye and it uses the nice thing about that is it uses the computational power of your phone which is pretty hefty right like that the computational power of your phone is bigger than than even what can be on the integrated board on a theta or on a small digital camera because phones are just i mean they're the microprocessors and them and, and the the boards and everything are customized uh, for, uh, you know, Apple or for Samsung or whatever. And they're pretty incredible. So you're just kind of leveraging that, um, that hardware architecture for these lenses. And I, so that's why I like them. I think they're kind of cool. They're using a good GPU. They are stitching it. You can live stream in 360. I've done that a couple times with them. Um, you can put that, and there's a couple of apps, you know, that will let you live stream, like you can live stream, um, in 360 for Facebook. I think Snap does it. You know, it's kind of, you can see what, what you're, what the point of what you're doing is. Are you trying to share it with other people live? Or are you trying to capture this and then edit it in apps? And so if it's all in the phone, you can kind of play faster that way where you can be like, like I do with my beadwork where I'm like, make the thing on the phone and then throw it in the, you know, I don't <laughs> So I think that, so, that's one way to start. So when you're stitching it, uh, are you uh, rotoscoping out? Like say you're holding it the phone or you've got it on a stick mm -hmm. a phone stick and you're you're filming as mm -hmm. you're walking down a trail or bike riding down a trail are you rotoscoping out then your arm and yeah it, it most of them I mean you you can undo that but you'd have to kind of hack it most of them have um AI that's already built in or it's I mean it's like it's mostly just software that's built in that's imagining that whatever point at which you're touching for whatever radius of X amount of millimeters around it are gonna be stitched together and then sh the pixels will be moved over it so that you kind of, you can, and you can adjust it in certain ones of them, you could adjust it. So even maybe I would be, you could make it wide enough so that I'm not in the shot. But a lot of times I like myself in the shot. So, but if you're, if you have a tripod, yeah, the tripod would be cut out. So does it take a lot of data on your phone then? Like, you know, like if you fill up your phone with photos or videos, um, there's this issue with getting all of that off your phone. Yeah. Somewhere. So I sometimes will down upload to my Dropbox and then pull it out of my Dropbox or else I have a special, um, flash drive that I'll plug into my phone and pull it off onto my flash drive and then plug that into my camera or into my computer and pull it into the computer program. But you also edit right into the phone. Is, is what you're saying. Yeah, some of them you couldn't edit right into the phone. There have been reasons why, that's why I use like the Ricoh Theta because it was just really cheap and I it's even smaller than my phone. So if I was worried about um, hitting a maximum of my phone, I would have that. Although it's, it's not actually that much more powerful of a computer than my phone. Um, but a lot of the softwares will have certain types of ways of where once you connect it to a computer, that's when they're actually going to recompile that that image file, so that you're using the GPU and the RAM as well as the um, the storage space of your computer uh, for certain. For it, they're they're different. Like the data does that a little bit more than the ones that sit right on top of the phone. Um, so you have options if you're like my phone doesn't have a lot of storage. Um, you might want to try like a Theta or some other small um, off the shelf. Uh, 360 video camera, but actually, I don't think that the ones that clip on the phone take up that much space. It's not a considerably larger file than um, taking any kind of video on your phone, actually. And that's just that's from the way in which they're encoding it. Okay. Question two is: What are some of the challenges and adjustments you have had creating, filming your projects using these emerging immersive technologies? given getting used to filming 360 video i think we've talked about it a little bit like stitching out the um tripod on in different surfaces like water and uh floors and um stitching out your hand uh what software would you say i know there's softwares that come with these different cameras would you say sticking to the software that comes with the cameras or do you think there's a software that we could import into that might be easier to learn? Yeah, I mean, some of them require at least, like with Google's research camera, we had to use their encoding process in order to sort of, um, they do uh, AI stitching in the cloud, and then I would have a protocol with which to download that 
uh, post, like I would upload the meta, you know, like the, the first information, then they would do the AI stitching and then I would download it back. And then those were, um, they were already sort of pre-stitched. And then if I wanted to edit them, I brought them into After Effects. Um, and a lot of them have a similar process in that way that because they're doing proprietary en encoding with the camera, you might need to use their program first to just sort of kind of use their protocol of stitching based on you know the way it's communicating to your phone or the way it's communicating to the hardware in the device. And then you can edit it in something like After Effects or there's, you know, but there's uh, lots of ways in which you can um, edit it if you need to. Um, a lot of times you don't need to. You With a lot of these 360 cameras, you could even just immediately put it onto YouTube and YouTube is a host 360 videos. So you don't necessarily need uh, a secondary editing software, but you can use familiar things like the Adobe Creative Suite. Do you want to jump in there, Nancy, with any uh, added information? Um, yeah, I guess like in terms of like beyond like the post and post production and technical part, like the actual part of shooting, um, you know, obviously the challenge of being whether you want to be in the shot or not, that's something you definitely need to plan. And there's ways, just tricks um, to get around that, you know, sometimes you can like shoot if you're doing 360, you can shoot one half and then you can and shoot the other half um, and then stitch the two um, hemispheres together um or you know or you could just be you can have you can make it so you're in the shot and you're part of the scene um one of the things that because i work with dance a lot and movement a lot one of the things i do research on is cyber sickness um like how comfortable is the motion in the piece that you're doing because the last thing you want is you want someone to put on your put on the headset or like experience your piece and like take it off right away uh, because um, it makes them feel ill from uh, motion sickness so I try to when I think when I create um, 360 or VR works I take that into consideration um, when I'm making the work so making sure that there isn't like really fast movements or movements that are too jarring or things that you know just movements that make make you feel you like off balance or just easing into movements uh, slowly. So I guess in a way that's kind of coming from like a cinematography kind of a 360 cinematography kind of standpoint, but you know, like in terms of like, yeah, just like thinking um, about how you, how motion works um, within the 360 environment and taking that into consideration when you, uh, when you do go out and shoot. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when somebody's starting in film, and there, you know, you ask how much does this cost? We generally start with a thousand dollars per edited minute is the general cost. If you want a small little crew to go out and film something and then edit it together, and it's like a three minute or five minute video, has anybody set a rate for three hundred and sixty film? Do you do you have a rate like that? You can kind of just throw a general sort of rate out there. Is there a cost per minute? I don't, I don't know that. <laughs> I've never, I've never done commercial work before, so I'm not sure. I'm kind of always just scaling to my budget or what's possible. Okay, to answer that question for that person, if, if a, a flat film costs a thousand dollars per edited minute, we're talking about specialized equipment, specialized knowledge and a specialized editing. It's a li little difficult just off the top of my head, if somebody were to ask me, I might triple that amount because it's it's an awful lot of work, stitching things out and piecing everything together. And then if you want 360 sound, you've got to get a 360 sound person in and then, you know, weave that into it all. So just generally. So that's why I think you should just yeah. do it yourself and go <laughs> create your own 360 like Nancy does. <laughs> And also like taking into consideration potential technical hiccups that you might come across as well. Like I think the most important thing is allotting lots of extra time. Just, you know, when I was working on my um, 360 film, it was, you know, even I had not even considered the fact that it would take eight hours just to load files from one hard drive to the other. Mm -hmm. So like factoring that kind of time, like how much uh, content and data that you have to move between one hard drive to the other. And also like how long it could take to render, like what, at what um like like what size are you shooting it is it like 4k we did our thing in 8k so it took a really long time to just even move one file and then in the export process um because 
we could not successfully export. Um, it kept failing. So what we ended up doing for that film was we exported frame by frame. And then we took all the frames. It was a four minute film, took all the frames and then compiled the frames into a video. So it's just working around that and then factoring in extra time that might be required to deal with those um, technical challenges. We've got yeah. eight minutes left and we've got three questions left. So question four, how do we create access to these type, types of projects for those people without the awareness or equipment to view them in order to support the works? I think that's a really great question. I taught a workshop this past weekend at IM4 around how to share your immersive projects on the web and on mobile. And I think it is important, um, and I know you're your question had a couple of different parts to it, but I'm going to go for that part, <laughs> um, which is, uh, I think it is important to know that that not everyone will have the specialized equipment to do your project and to think about a secondary and tertiary audience. And so maybe people will be able to go to Sundance Film Festival or to Imaginative and see the full installation of your work with five different room scale headsets and a, um, you know, a beautiful um, uh, immersive projection and sensors and body sensors and motion capture and all of that. Um, and if they don't see it live and if they don't see the big installation um, and it doesn't come to an area near them, how would you like them to, to understand your work or is there a secondary audience version? And I think you can think about the web because obviously as Nancy you know, talked about A-Frame, there are ways in which you could um, you can view web uh, you know, VR, or you could also just have that 360 video embedded in a website where people can kind of scroll around using their mouse to see it. Um, there are ways in which you can take the story and break it down into different transmedia. It could be something that is conversational through a chat app, and it could be something that is mobile optimized. It could be so, a, a, you know, a website that embeds these 360 videos. It can be ways in which you're, you're sharing the story through illustration. I think it's important to think of how to make your work accessible to, to more audiences, because I think that's something that we're struggling with right now within this community is um, it's hard to get it to people at scale. We still don't have, uh, we have a lot more people who have consumer VR headsets than at any other time in my life when I've done VR, you know, since I've been doing virtual reality work since the 90s. So like, this is the first time we've ever had such a big audience, but still there's a much bigger audience that is, um, that is, really easy with using the web and using you know game environments and and game engines and doing multiplayer things online and building their own servers in that way so there are ways in which you can culture jam and, and create some of these experiences in in game engines and places where there already are incredible audiences like in minecraft and all of those kind of awesome spaces so i think um I think we have to think about expanding this and maybe VR and AR and all these things help us understand new ways of telling stories, but maybe we bring it back to other uh, more accessible media like, um, you know, phones and, and screens um, and laptops. Yeah, and you I just want to... Oh, I just want to plug, um, I am teaching an intro to web VR uh, workshop Friday. Um, you can find the sign up link um, at the IM4 lab. And that's a great way, learning A-Frame is a great way to, um, as a, a, like a way to, you know, access technology uh, through your web browser or mobile phone that um, you can view VR works or create your own VR works in. Yeah, you had mentioned earlier, you could upload it to YouTube. And I know I had mine up on YouTube and when I was working with my editor, she'd send it to me to a link on YouTube that I could just take my phone and experience by just turning myself around. I could see the world that she was helping me create. So I'm going to jump down to another question. I don't think we're going to get through all of the questions because um, we only have five minutes left here. If next stage is peace and prosperity, how do you bring along the people harnessing the rivers for electricity? hydroelectricity that powers your research in addition to all the processors of your tools? Interesting question. Do you, do you get, understand what he's asking? Yeah. yeah, you know, and Angela Davis said you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools, and I understand that we have a, a complex culture and system, and I think we it's very important for me to stop thinking in binaries as that you can either have this or you can have that. You can either have 
an ability to um, think of a sustainable world, or you can have the world in which you're telling people that they should live in a stamp. There isn't an either, or it's both, and it's now, and it's happening. If, if we want to have sustainable practices, and we're using the internet right now to talk about that, that doesn't mean that we will have an internet in the next seven generations, or maybe we will and it will look different, but it, we can still hold our values and say that they need to be met without already colonizing our ideas by saying um, there are impossible trade-offs because we don't know if there are. We don't know yet a culture where, where indigenous um, practices and concepts of um, sovereignty and um, and uh, you know, balance within our ecology. We haven't seen that yet in in collaboration with the kind of diverse world that we're living in um, right now. We haven't seen it, so we don't actually know if we have if we are forced to make those trade offs. But I do understand that question, and I do understand that the way in which we can rail against technology, we could choose to not use it, and we could choose to move in other directions as ways to make statements. Um, I choose to be in the middle and in the thick of that conversation by saying I am using technology to comment and talk about the problems that exist in our world and to, to begin having those conversations. And I don't think it's an either or yet. It's, it's both and and all. Nancy, do you want to uh, give your final words on this subject? Yeah, I think it's really important for us to, uh, it's, Accountable and responsible culture creation um, is something that we need to consider um, as artists and as creators because everything we do um, has a cultural imprint. Um, and, you know, we do live in this world that is run by capitalism. And, you know, there's so many contradictions that exist, you know, even where our funding comes from sometimes, you know. It, so that's why it's important, like, um, like Amelia, like I choose to also to work with technology and I understand, you know, with technology, uh, the chips that are in our phones and the mining and the environmental degradation that comes with the creation of technology, it all exists. Um, and it's important for us to consider all of those things. And that's why it's also important to uh, be grounded um, in your work and in your activism work as well, especially when you're an artist and you have cultural influence and cultural imprint that you create. I'd like to thank our guests, Amelia and Nancy, and um, I want to also thank our incredible matriarchs, our creative director, Loretta Todd, and our, our media matriarch, Cease Weiss, Amethyst First Rider, and Tracy, Tracy Kim Bonneau. And uh, we're going to close with our uh, drum beat. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.